Awesome. If you guys have your Bibles with you, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If not, um, we have the email sent out to most of the members in the church. So it, I usually send out the less invite email just so it's easier to follow along as well as you get to go back and double check what the scriptures say. Um, but what's actually just really encouraging here for today is, um, you know, I'm doing a lesson titled How to Handle Being Sinned Against. Whoa, How yeah. to Handle Being Sinned Against. I don't know if you know this, but already by this, this title lesson, some of us are going to think, man, this is going to suck already. <laughs> right? like, this is not something I enjoy at all. You know, even in uh, Chris's welcome, he talked about John chapter 8 and what are we free from. Ian was actually very specific. He didn't say you're freed from sin. He said you're free from your own sin. Yeah. Th that's actually quite specific because we're still going to remain in the world as well as with other sinners that we're still going to be sinned against. Uh -oh. Right? Just because you start abiding by the word and everything doesn't mean you're still not going to get hurt. Doesn't it still mean that you're not going to have people make mistakes towards you. So some will hear and say this, well, hey, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really like this idea to be sinned against, to be hurt and everything. But, you know, the fact is, is that no matter what, we are going to be sinned. Christians and believers alike, you know, not just at some point in your life is this going to happen, but it's going to be consistent. It's not just one day I'm preparing you for this blue moon event. It's going to be consistent in your life. Your know, trials will happen every now and then, but sin is going to be on the daily. You know, and it's more likely going to come from the people sitting next to you. You, know, you look into your left and to your right, and you start to get a little bit paranoid now. Like, no way. You, know, you might actually go home, and it's going to be the people that you live with. It's going to be the people that you're closest to. Those are the ones that we are preparing for. But I'm not trying to get you to be a little bit paranoid at dinner tonight and just staring at the person across from you. Like, it's you, right? You're the one that Sean was talking. No, that's not the point of this sermon. But the thing is just saying that this is going to be something that we can't avoid. That we're going to actually have to learn how to do this then. You know, most of us, the people who we are today and the faults that we have, in one way or another, it's come from the back of somebody sinning against us as we've grown up. You know, the fears and doubts that we may have, it's because our parents sinned against us and, and we reacted not the right way. It's because someone hurt us way back in the past and, and that scarred us in one way. And so this is extremely important of growing as a person and closer to God and as a church is how do we react to sin in our own life. You know, I think the world has tried to avoid this at any cost. That we live in a world that tries to create quote unquote safe places and they create a narrative where you're either a victim or a victor. And to be honest, growing up though, we find out that this world, there's no such thing as a safe place. You can be in church, God's holy place, and to be honest, it's still not that safe. You read in the book of Acts, that was probably the worst place to be in the Roman Empire. There was nothing safe about it. And yet this world tries to put us, you know, you're either a victim or a victor. And to be honest, both of those are still not very good. You may think that the world will say, you're a victor, that's awesome. Actually, that's still not the right perspective to have. See, there's not a big difference between the two. Being a victor is not much better than being a victim as the world describes it. What I mean by that is both of them are focused on self and the wrong that happened to you. See, let's look at Paul's perspective when it comes to his hardships. In 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 30, it reads here, Since many of you are boasting in the way that the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you and takes advantage of you and puts on airs and slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we, too, uh, we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I too am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about, uh, uh, also boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. 
I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open seas. I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of the concerns of all the churches. Who is weak and I don't face daily, uh, excuse me, feel weak? Who is led into sin and I don't inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast about the things that show my weaknesses. See, when we read this letter and start to understand that he's not talking about being either of the two that the world tries to say that you can be. We see here that he's not a victim, nor does he boast that he's a victor. We look at this and there's no look at me factor. There's none of this. Look what I've been through. He's saying all these things to show him, guys, what is this? It doesn't matter. He was taking away all their excuses by saying, hey, I've had it the worst. And yet, I have nothing to complain about. Wow. The, the, there, he's not saying that there was anything to overcome. He's not even saying, like, look at all the things that I overcame. He wasn't even saying it that way. He was just saying, this is life. This is just what happened to me. And I have nothing to complain about. There was no victim or victor. See, when you think about being a victor, you still think about the wrongs that's happened to you. And you've overcome it. Where God's not even saying it that way. He's saying, that's just life learn how to have God's perspective on it. When we think that we're a victor, we, we still look at the wrong that's happening to us. He had no degree of look at me in any way, shape, or form. Because all he looked at, he's like, this was not suffering to me. I've seen God's love throughout it. I, I've seen God's sovereignty throughout it. He later on says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out for you so that you can endure it. This is something that he even wrote just a little bit later, understanding like God's always sovereign. God is always loving. You know, have you ever had this kind of prayer or said this kind of prayer? Thank God that I am in New Zealand during COVID-19. Right? We've all said that. But when you say that, does that mean people who are not in New Zealand shouldn't be thankful of God? That's not what you mean, right? That, that, that's not what we're saying. And that's kind of what he's saying here is like, just because you're in the right perspective, people that are not, are not in that position shouldn't be any less thankful. And so he's giving this understanding that, you know, we, we should always be thankful. It's kind of like when, when you're going through a strong time and, you're, and God's blessing you financially. But just because God's blessing you doesn't mean that the person who's struggling financially is less blessed by God, right? And so he's giving this perspective. He's like, yes, I've gone through challenging things, but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean God's less loving or more loving or whatever. It's just God is sovereign, period. And he's giving this on our hearts. See, even when we look at New Zealand and us being here in New Zealand uh, during COVID-19, if we read this scripture, maybe it's because we have weak faith. He thought, hey, if I was in America during COVID-19, that would be too much for me to bear. Maybe that's why he allowed me to be in New Zealand. Now that really changes our perspective rather than what God's doing and, and how he's helping us. See, Paul was not writing this to say, hey, since I'm the one who faced all these things, I'm the only one that has the ability to complain. No, he was writing this to say, there's nothing to complain about, but only to boast in the Lord. If you survived a shipwreck or your older brother's making fun of you, boast in the Lord. <laughs> it didn't matter. He's like, these are all things that I went through. Maybe you're not going through as much, but God's sovereign. It, it doesn't matter. See, we want to believe that no one else understands what we're going through and feel like we're the only ones that, that has ever been through it. Why? 
because we, we like this idea is because maybe if we think that other people have gone through the same thing or that's just life, it takes away the justifications of our reactions to it. It takes away the justifications of our, of our anger, of us being scarred by it in all these things. So you might say, well then, well everyone gets to be mad and sad and you know, that, that's, just, that's just how it is. You know, everyone reacts this way. Well, guess what? You're, you're not like everyone. Well, you, Sean, you just said I was. You said everyone went through it. Okay, yeah, you're like everyone in the pain, but you're not like everyone called in your reaction. As Christians, we're called to react differently. See, in 2 Corinthians, as we continue on reading, verse 10 through 3 through 5, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight, we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See here it talks about that we, we're not waging war. We're not reacting in the same way the world reacts. We have to learn how to fight with the words and the weapons of God. See, we actually understand, if you look at it, Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. It says, now there's kind of do two different statistics. It says either every eight minutes a Christian is dying for his faith. That might be a loose interpretation of what dying for your faith means. But more, more precisely, it says that there are 11 Christians killed every day for their faith every single day even in western society i think it's trying so hard to push christianity out you talk about islam you're islamic you talk about buddhism you you're tolerant and woke you talk bad about christianity you're educated you know christianity is one of the most persecuted religions so we better figure out how to react being sinned against Right? We, we can't go very far if we don't like being hurt against. And so the lesson is not just to show other people's mistakes, their sinful nature, their intentional wrongs towards you. Are you good at being sinned against? And I believe this is a skill because it's not that easy. So that's my lesson. And point number one, what I believe is uh, point number one, we suck at it. <laughs> I want to be mad and to support my reactions and my emotions. I want these things. Um, but guess what, we, we have lived, you know, the thing is, we, we see all these things and when it comes to about being sinned against, it's different than reacting to your own sin. Because I believe our own sin, we kind of get used to it, right? We don't feel the sting as much. We, we, the, the taste is, is um, diluted, the pain is bearable for our own sin. But when it comes to other people sinning against us, we are super impatient, right? You know, have you ever dealt with somebody else's sin that they were struggling with the exact same thing you were struggling with, but you get super impatient with them, <laughs> right? Why are you doing this? And you do it like the next day, right? And, and, and that, that's how we can do. But here, I want us to read a scripture and actually see quite the opposite in how we react. We know the scripture quite well. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. It says here, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. You know, of all the scriptures we do not want to read when we're being hurt, is probably this scripture, right? <laughs> when someone hurt us, we don't want to read this at all. The only reason we want to read this is to tell them you're not loving. Probably, probably that's, that's the main reason. But I read this and you think, man, which one of these goes straight out the window when someone hurts you? You know, sometimes it's actually good to kind of read, quote unquote, the opposite of this scripture. And I kind of wrote it out for you guys here. What's the opposite of this scripture? Read it again. It says, hate is impatient. Hate is rude. It often envies. It often boasts. It is proud. Hate dishonors others. 
It is self-seeking. It is easily angered. It keeps records of wrong. Hate delights in evil and mourns at the truth. It never protects, never trusts, never hopes, never perseveres. But guess what? Hate never succeeds. I believe reading the opposite is not scriptural, meaning don't go back and, you know, this is not biblical in one way or another, but it helps, it gives us another perspective. And I think most of these things are things that we can do that are opposite of love when people start hurting us. I think the first one is just to honor others. That's probably the one that creeps into our hearts right as way is we want to start slandering. The first thing we usually want to do when someone hurts us is start talking about it to someone else. And we're not talking about it like in a way that, wow, this person's super nice and I understand that he didn't mean to hurt me. That's probably not how the conversation's going, right? You know, it, it, it's, you're, you're slandering. We want to tear them down. And, you know, we think about this and sometimes even family. Family's usually the ones that are worst at this. Gossip and slander. You know, you want to know what's going on. We all know we have that one auntie who we can go to and we can find out all the problems in our family. Right? You just call up that one auntie, that one uncle, that one cousin, and they'll tell you everything wrong going on in the family. Right? There's something wrong with that. But it can be hard to control, and I believe that's why this is what um, Paul, excuse me, David even prayed in Psalms 141, verse 3. He says, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. See, I believe here that that it's something that we want to react to whenever we get hurt is we want to start slandering and hurting people. And I think it's mainly because we don't really know how to deal with our emotions. So what do we do? We talk about it. And when we don't really want to talk about it and don't know how to deal with that properly, what do we do? We lie. And when someone says, hey, are you doing okay? We say, yeah, I'm I'm fine. We, We don't really want to open on up. And so here it says in Proverbs 10, verse 18, whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. So we do either. We either slander or we lie because we don't really want to get open in our lives. I think the next thing we can do is records of wrong, bitterness. See, bitterness creeps into our hearts through the smallest of cracks. Before long, you're telling the same story over and over to the people around you where they already know what you're going to say. You start telling that same story like, oh, I know where this is going. I know what they're talking about. You know, we still have those friends that are talking about something that happened to them five years ago. You know, and it's usually what happens to somebody. And and this is usually what happens to somebody when they get bitter, when they don't really want to talk to other people, but they don't know how to be healed in the power of prayer, that they're afraid of slandering, but they don't know how to deal with their heart in prayer. And so it just stays in their heart and they get bitter about it. And in Hebrews 12, it it warns us here before long, Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows, uh, grows up to cause trouble and defile many. It talks about here and warns us that bitterness has the ability to ruin everything, everything that you love. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you're bitter at one person and, and it ruins even like the biggest of events. Have you ever had that where you had kind of like a, a, a bad relationship in the church or something or somebody hurt you and you start planning out like a, a spy mission and how to go to church and out of church? You start thinking in your head like, okay, I know where this brother usually sits. You know, he talks to that brother. I'm going to go in and out and try to just be a spy. You know, and we literally plan out like these whole like missions in our mind of just like how to get in and out without being seen. And it it ruins everything. It ruins our worship of God. It ruins our other relationships. It's just getting that records of wrong. And I think the way that all this comes about, slander as well as bitterness, is it comes from us boasting, which is our self-righteousness. I think this is the major root of why we respond so poorly to our injustices. We think to ourselves, man, I would have never done that to you. Man, the people that I look up to, they would have never said that. They would have never done that. And we get self-righteous and we boast. And we abandon the the humility of Paul where he's like, yeah, I went through all these difficult things, but that doesn't matter. And we take up our pride. 
And see, I think about this is that the most dangerous thing about people sinning against you is that it hurts us and it gives us ammunition to feel how we feel because we feel justified and you get to you you get the right to feel how you feel being right is like the scariest place you can ever be <laughs> especially like in an argument in a marriage that's like the worst position you can be Amen, bro. being right because it, it, you you start to like set your ground you know I'm right but it doesn't even matter anymore it, that, that's what it's like whenever we start to get this self-righteousness of like they sin they've messed up yeah but you've had no grace and mercy this whole time. Do, do you see your own sin in this as well? I think being wrong is so much easier. There's less room for sin because you already sinned. You already filled up that gap. You know what I mean? See, why do we do all these things? Well, because I think it's, we're bruised and it hurts. And guess what? I don't know if you've ever had like a bruise, but you kind of press it a little bit and it feels good. You know? And that's kind of what we do with the pain that's in our hearts is that we've been hurt and we kind of keep pressing it because we don't really love it, but, but we're addicted to it. See, most people don't like being sad or regretful, but they can't help it. They're, 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 they're not exactly, I wouldn't say they're drawn to these feelings, but because it's undealt with in their heart, it's just something that comes up uh, all the time and consistently in their lives. So then, you know, what do we do? We sin as well. We give into the feelings and doubts. And we forget about the most important thing about this is us giving into these reactions, whether that's self-righteousness, boasting, or bitterness. We forget the most important thing is those are sins as well. And it's not just a magic word, sin, that it will ultimately take you away from God. See, in Psalms 51 verse 4, it talks about here just having a good heart that David had when he sinned. It says Psalms 51 verse 4, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. See, David's sin was felt by many. He actually you know, slept with a man's wife and killed the man to cover up his own sin. But yet he says, the only one I've sinned against and the only one that I'm really focused on is God. See, I want us to learn that whether it's the bitterness, the self-righteousness, boasting, whatever other things that come into our heart when we're hurt, I want you to write those things down that you feel and picture yourself going to the throne of God and you have these sins before you, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, and try and picture yourself justifying yourself before God, explaining yourself uh, to Him and your sin. Well, God, I know I was unforgiving, but you don't understand what happened to me. Try, try and picture yourself before God when, when those things are happening. So we understand we're not very good at this, right? Most of the reasons that we are hurt and still hurt in our life is because someone sinned against us and we didn't react very well. So point number two, Jesus doesn't. He doesn't suck at it. He's extremely good and lets us learn from his reaction towards sin. We know probably what we should do already. You should forgive. You should not slander. You should love him. We know those things, but let's learn exactly what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 to 68. It says here, Those who had arrested Jesus took him to uh, Cephas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the uh, guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus, so they can they could uh, excuse me, so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing up against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One 
and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face, struck him with his fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? We read throughout this, and we see what an amazing example Jesus is. He didn't do, say, or feel any t uh, aggression towards his wrongdoers. You know, and, and we look at ourselves and we get mad when somebody drives too close to us or says something insensitive. Wow, like even try and remember, what's the last thing that you got mad about? Was it, was it even sin that you got angry about? I know it wasn't the last thing I got mad about, but I remember, and I've told this story before, a uh, long time ago when we were first starting the church in Sydney, um, you know, I was setting out the chairs and everything uh, before church and I was coming there to serve and the leader of the church, he came up to me and uh, he started talking to me about how to set up the chairs better. And first of all, I thought the chairs looked good, um, but right away I was like, you're not going to ask me how my morning is? <laughs> I was like so sensitive. I was so mad. I was like, you're not going to ask me how I am, you know? And amen, he probably should have asked me, but I shouldn't have been so sensitive. But we can be that way, right? We can be just so sensitive on the smallest of things. And then we read about what Jesus is going through and how he reacts. And it's just like, it's just night and day right here. But I pray that I always have a soft heart to when it comes to Jesus' reaction here. Like, dang. Like, not even one nasty look. You know, looking at Peter, like, are you serious, bro? You know, you heard that rooster, mate. Come over here. Like, you know, like, not even that. Not even one, you're going to hell. Like, nothing. Not even one of these little things do we see. Not even a feeling of anger. We find out later he was just remorseful and sad about everybody. He's like, he, he, we find out later he prayed the prayer of for, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That was a heart. I, you, you can never beat the reaction of sin here. We may reason, well... Maybe Jesus didn't say anything because he was already surrendered to the cross and the people who he's going to talk to, maybe they already decided in their heart that they were going to put him on there anyway. Maybe that's why he didn't speak up. Well, yeah, maybe that's a little bit true. But guess what? Even when Jesus did come back and resurrect, we don't see him pull Peter off to the side and pull the other people that, uh, you know, that left him. We don't see them pull off to the side and have like this little mentoring group and confront their sin. We don't even see that. You know, he knew that they knew their sin and their guilt for it and he thought that was the strongest lesson. Wow. See, sometimes we can even have that where we are rubbing people's faces in their sin. You know, we, 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 we see a sin, maybe it hurt us, but we just continue to rub people's faces in it instead of coming to them and wanting to help them. You know, for most people, guess what? Life is hard. Justified or not, they may feel that way. Life is difficult for most people. We don't need to be rubbing people's faces in their sin. Sometimes we say, I forgave them, but I still need to talk to them about it. Yeah, to a point. I think the only time we really need to do that is when it's not obvious to them. See, Jesus didn't come back to Peter and say, you disobeyed me, you lied, you this. He said, okay, I, you know what you did, right? I just love my sheep. That was his D time. That was, that was his mentoring time. That was it. He's like, I, I love you, and I'm just going to call you to repentance. That's it. See, it was in our sins that actually God showed the greatest display of love. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it gives us this truth about love. It says, above all, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. I wonder how covered Peter felt during that time when he spoke to Jesus in the resurrection, after the resurrection. I wonder how, how much he just felt covered by God's love. See, even when we go and speak the truth, if it's not in love, it's in vain. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody who is telling you the truth? about yourself, but you didn't feel loved by them, so you decided, I ain't talking to you, right? 
whatever they were saying did not even register in your mind at all. Had nothing to do with the, the truth, had everything to do with the love. And so this is just something that it teaches us again. But we also can't think we're loving somebody by withholding the truth from them. Right? So now we're stuck in this position of what do we do then, Sean? You're saying talk to them and not talk to them. You're saying, well, what, what do we actually do? Guess what? We, we should all be a little bit confused. All I'm saying is that the major difference is not whether we talk or not. Is that the major difference is there's a difference between winning them over and beating them. There's a huge difference between those two. See, I understand calling everyone to the standards of the scriptures when it comes to sin, but let us not forget who the enemy is. Jesus understood this above all. He said, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I know who the corporate is. I know who's the one who's behind all this. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. I know who the authorities are. It should be, it should be a, a, a constant reminder for us to know that we're fighting against Satan. See, we think about this story about Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. All of the law of Moses was calling her to be stoned to death. There were actually more than two witnesses towards her crime. And yet we find here of Jesus' verdict. John 8, 10 through 11, it says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? After he calls them to stone her to death. Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. See, we see here that he didn't, he wasn't going away from the law of Moses, but he showed the greatest thing about the laws of Moses was love. He showed mercy. Mercy with the call to repentance, but still mercy. Mercy can be one of the strongest lessons for a sinner. You know, yes, we deal with the hard-hearted differently as we see Jesus confronting everybody's sin when they're Pharisees and, and hypocrites. Yeah, that's a different thing. But when those who want to change, we show grace. See, I believe the greatest love was not in Jesus' sacrifice, but Him taking up the responsibilities of our sin. Anyone has died for another person. People have jumped in front of a bullet, jumped on the grenade, whatever it may be. That, that's happened before. But only Jesus has taken up your sin. And we may think, okay, the call for us to take up somebody else's sin, well, they won't learn from it then. If I take up their responsibility and their consequences, they won't learn from it. Well, you have to remind yourself, did you learn from God's grace? God took up our sin. What did you learn from that? He's not allowing us to take up our consequences. And you may say that for other people, but that's exactly what God did for you. And guess what? That was the greatest lesson we could have learned. Yeah. Like, wow, I, I did nothing to deserve this. And we decide after that fact, I'm going to dedicate my life to God now. Now, I don't think we can be the, the saviors for other people, but Jesus going on the cross was something to be imitated. When's the last time that, that you took up the consequences for someone's sin instead of just rubbing it in their face? Be like, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to battle this with you. And guess what? Parents do that all the time. The kids get in a car accident or they mess up, they take up the cost. And they, they don't rub it in their face or anything. They're just, I'm glad to be here for you and that you're safe. That's the type of love and mercy that we should be showing in the church as well. See, Jesus did that. It says here in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Great, Jesus' greatest display of love was him laying down his life for our sins and taking up the consequences. And I think that's a great example for us to do as well. You know, we're, we're never not going to be hurt. We're never not going to be sinned against. We can actually control how much sin that we have and we fight those battles. But someone's always going to hurt you. And again, it's more than likely going to come for the people in this church. But the only thing that you can really do is how you react to that sin. Are you going to be full of grace and mercy? Are you going to take up their sin? Are you going to have a loving reaction? Or are we going to give into it how the world gives into it? You guys, I'm not good at this either. 
I think there's a lot of things that each one of us are not good at and we can kind of look at the opposite of 1 Corinthians 13 and like, that's exactly what I do. But we got to learn how to react to sin and be like Jesus in his sacrifice. Thank you guys very much. That's the lesson for today. Preach the word out. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word out. You see, I was lost before I was found in my pride.